My pleasure to introduce Jess Robinson. Jess is the state archaeologist, and I just want to read a little bit here about the biography. Uh, he's the Vermont state archaeologist, and he works within the Division for Historic Preservation, and that's under the Agency of Commerce and Community Development. And uh, he received, he's a native Burlingtonian, and uh, he received his BA in Anthropology and English from the University of Vermont, 1999. His MA in Literature from the University of Kent in 2001. His MA in Anthropology from University of at Albany, SUNY in 2008. And his PhD in Anthropology from the University of Alma, SUNY 2015. And during much of that time, just as also a research supervisor at the University of Vermont consulting archaeology program. That's probably good. You don't have to get into the other stuff. <laughs> I, I, I just wanted to say just a personal bit. I've known just for a couple of years here and as a frequent visitor to VHS and Barry. Um, I've been over to his offices and, it, and they have a beautiful display over there. The artwork alone is something to see. But actually it tells the whole story going back some 10,000 years ago of Indian inhabitants in Vermont at, at times when the glacier is still there. So it's a really interesting place to visit, and I highly recommend it. Thanks a lot, man. Appreciate it. And thanks a lot for coming out. This is uh, Vermont Archaeology Month. It's been going on since 1995, so I guess this, this is the uh, uh, 23rd year. Um, it's a little bit of a stripped down year this year. We've had some transition between it, but I'm, I'm keeping the, the torch alive uh, by doing various events, and I'm certainly happy to be here with all of you. Um, so I'm going to go through you know, what is essentially 13,000 years of prehistory. Um, it is only going to touch on a few uh, points, um, and depending upon the clock, I might skip ahead for a few things. And, and while uh, this is sort of a lecture format, you know, if something is really uh, bugging you or you don't understand something, feel free to uh, you know, raise a hand or shout out. That's fine. So um, just really quickly, for those of you who aren't aware, uh, archaeology um, is the study of the human past um, through the things that people left behind, <clears throat> their material remains. Um, that can be artifacts, that can be architecture in the place, um, in some places in the world where it preserves. It can be landscapes that are natural, uh, but meant something to the people that uh, inhabited them in the past, or modified uh, landscapes. And everything in between, things we call features, the remains of fire hearts, or storage pits, or refuse pits. Um, and all of that is under the purview of archaeology and what we study. And I'll give you some examples of the various things that archaeologists um, have studied and are currently studying, um, and how that scope is broadening as science uh, progresses. Just a brief overview. Um, this is done about a year and a half ago, so it's a little out of date now, but as of about um, uh, January 1st, 2017, there were 6,067 archaeological mm -hmm. sites uh, known in Vermont, um, which is a maximum site density of about 1.8 uh, per square kilometer which is actually below average for uh, all the states in the U.S., actually quite a bit below average. Um, only due about due to the mountainous terrain? Yeah, and the lack of um, testing, which, which I'll get to in a second, because, um, because um, uh, only about 2,200 of those are Native American sites. The rest are historic uh, homesteads and farmsteads, early military installations and forts, underwater shipwrecks, industrial archaeological sites like lime kilns and potash kilns, all the things that make up the rich history of our state. Um, and as you note, um, the vast majority of, in fact, probably 99% or more of the archaeology that's done in Vermont is done in advance of development. So basically what we call consulting or regulatory archaeology. Various state and federal laws uh, that um, that uh, um, encourage or in some cases require archaeological review to be done. Um, and so this map is a sort of heat map or a heat density map of where are the, all the archaeological sites have been found to date. And as you can see, the vast majority of the archaeological sites found in Vermont have been found in Chittenden County. Why? Were there more Native Americans or early historic people there? No, it's where all the development happened. 
or a lot of it. Same with Addison County and a little bit in Franklin. These blips are interesting because um, they're in the Green Mountain National Forest, and they do, as a federal entity, they do a good job of documenting the archaeological resources in their forest lands, the vast majority of which are historic towns, villages that have been subsumed <laughs> up into the forest after they were abandoned uh, in the late 1800s. So if you've heard of Glastonbury or um, Old Job or all of these other, not just individual households or farmsteads or hamlets, but entire towns um, that have gone back into the forest and are now you know, archaeological sites. Um, this is just an overview, uh, another view. It's a, it's a small screen, so you're not going to be able to see much. But here is Chittenden County. All the red dots are Native American archaeological sites. And this is a little bit you know, misleading because it, the dots are very large. It's actually not that many archaeological sites. But then here's the, the I-89 corridor coming up roughly following um, uh, the, uh, the Winooski River. And as you get into the Montpelier area, you can see the archaeological sites really thin out. The blues are historic archaeological sites. So Native American archaeological <laughs> sites, which are the subject of this talk, by and large, are really absent in the interior. Why is that Native Americans weren't there? Absolutely not. It's because uh, there has been little modern development uh, after archaeological review laws um, and statutes came into place. Um, and so we know that their Native Americans were here, but most of our sites have been documented through collectors or happenstance, finding things along ponds, <coughs> scouring old archives, the Hemingway, um, you know, uh, uh, gazetteers and other um, town histories. So with that as a sort of background, um, I'm just going to uh, sort of go through some high points. And we did a pretty good job, five minutes or so, so we're on track here. Um, starting with the earliest Native Americans that uh, entered the region and, and entered Vermont. Um, they are not now, it is widely believed, the first Native Americans uh, to have inhabited the continent, um, which this is a subject, if you are at all interested in archaeology and the popular press, is constantly being written about how old were the first Native American, the purported pre-Clovis people. And um, I, like many of my colleagues, now believe that there were uh, Native Americans earlier than the Paleo-Indians, uh, which for a long time were thought to be the oldest now. But it's not relevant for Vermont because up until, as we'll see in a second, about 13,500 years ago, we were totally covered in glacial ice. So people couldn't live here. P people weren't living on top of ice. And um, about 13,300 years ago, this is what Vermont looked like, more or less, at least the large uh, lake features. The meltwater as the glaciers were receding, um, you know, obviously formed water. That water was filling all of the big valley basins, and in this case, the Champlain Valley, what is now the Champlain Valley, all the way down into the Hudson Lowlands, and was all stopped up by a huge dam down at Long Island at the Narrows. At about 13,300 years ago, this little bit of ice here uh, gave way, and a, a couple hundred feet of Glacial Lake Iroquois ran in and caused a catastrophic flood which blew out this dam and sent fresh water out into um, the Atlantic. Um, <clears throat> about 100 years later, uh, it filled up again as further meltwater um, uh, came from the glaciers. But this time, there was a catastrophic flood that eventually went out the Gulf of St. Lawrence, out what is now the St. Lawrence River. This is Glacial Lake Hitchcock, another uh, massive glacial lake that formed in, um, in uh, the uh, Connecticut River Valley, and is thought to have drained about 12,800 years ago. Could you put a finger on where Montpelier is, or Calus, or East Montpelier? Um, <laughs> right about, well, oh, geez, this is tough. So we right about there. there. Okay. Thank you. There, and again, I'm not depicting all the glacial lakes. There's actually a glacial lake called Glacial Lake Winooski that actually came up into these <laughs> interior regions. It's not very well studied. Stephen Wright at UVM has written a little bit about it as well. So basically, all this meltwater had to go somewhere. And it was impounded by all this stuff that the glaciers had left behind. So it formed all these glacial lakes everywhere. But they were unstable. So as soon as one of these you know, gravel dams would, would burst, they would drain. They would hit another water body. It was a very dynamic time period. And as far as we know, Native Americans did not live in this region uh, at this point. But um, 
as that last major flood went out to the Gulf of St. Lawrence, uh, the glacial ice had depressed the weight of um, the land in Vermont so much that it was below sea level. So seawater ran in, including into the, uh, the Champlain Valley. Here's a close up of it here. And for about 3,000 years ago, from about 13,000 to about 10,000 years ago, uh, the Champlain Valley was an arm of the Atlantic Ocean that we call the Sample Champlain Sea. And um, this was uh, not um, a sterile water body like some of those glacial lakes were. They had nothing in them. They were ice cold water, fed from the melting glaciers, didn't have a lot of fish, um, or if any, um, that's debated. Uh, but when it became an arm in the Atlantic Ocean, uh, it was a very thriving cold water water body. So here, um, some of you might have heard of the Charlotte Whale, which is at the Perkins Museum in, uh, in, at UVM. That was found in 1849. And um, you know, when I worked at UVM, I was, my office was right next to the Perkins Museum. And I would go in there and, and say, I know we can radiocarbon date this whale. I know it. And they'd say, the geologists would say, no, you can't, because they sunk it in horse glue in 1849 to preserve it. And that introduces a lot of modern carbon, which skews the radiocarbon dates. And I said, well, what if you drill into the teeth? You know, because I don't think the, the, that it would have gotten into the teeth. And they're like, I don't know. I leave, and some guy from the New York State Museum says, hey, how about drilling into the teeth? And then they're like, oh, OK. And he got a great date from it 13,000 years ago, almost exactly. So right at the initiation of the Champlain Sea. Um, but you can see here, you can't see here because it's the small writing, but various other marine mammals have been found in the Champlain Sea. These are the radiocarbon dated ones, and they include harbor seal, bowhead whale, finback whale, walrus, narwhal. So a very, very um, biotically rich, um, but cold water environment, much like uh, Labrador or some of the sub subarctic regions today. Um, there were also fish uh, that remains that have been found, including cod and a lot of mollusk remains. So just an idea of what it might look like 13,000 years ago in the Champlain Valley. Something like this. And at the same time in the Northeast, we can begin to see humans moving in. Um, radiocarbon dates, which are very rare for this early period. Vermont doesn't have very good preservation in its soils, nor does most of the Northeast. Nevertheless, through about 50 years of professional archaeology in the region, we've identified a number of radiocarbon dates that tell us that Native Americans were roughly synchronous moving in. Just parenthetically, um, you might think uh, passively that being the oldest Native Americans in the region that might be the most, you know, quote unquote, primitive or simple. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth. While there were very low population densities, hunter-gatherers moving about in the landscape, they were uh, the master lithic or stone craftsmen of the entire archaeological record in Vermont. They did things with stone that no one else did, at least as far as we know in Vermont afterward. Obviously, there were other things, other art forms that Native Americans worked in, in bone and in, in uh, wood, which was not around very uh, prominently during this early period. It was a tundra-like environment. But in regards to stone, they were master craftsmen. And so I had a replicator uh, make for me one of these um, characteristic Paleo-Indian spear points. Quite large, very well made with this ribbon-like flaking pattern, often made from materials that were distant from the sites where they're found. And then after they had made these large spear points, the very last thing they did before they'd be used was knock from both sides this channel up the middle. And this is the hallmark of Paleo-Indian points. It's really the reason you, you can tell them apart from any other point. Um, also, the materials by which they're made and their general expert craftsmanship to find them. But this is extremely hard to do. If you're a modern flint napper today, you're sort of considered an expert if you can pull off one of these what are called flutings. Um, and they result in breakage a lot of the time. So what uh, I and uh, my colleague uh, John Croc, a professor of anthropology at UVM and the director of the Consulting Archaeology Program, and Weatherby Dorshow from the University of New Mexico did was we started um, saying, all right, where are all the Paleo-Indian sites in Vermont? And this wasn't as easy of a task as you might have thought. Uh, we had to spend several years going around to farmers 
in the Champlain Basin and elsewhere and you know, convincing them that we weren't trying to take their artifacts. We were just interested in documenting where they found them and you know, taking pictures and measurements and made a lot of great relationships that way. Um, and documented securely as we could um, to augment the professional archaeological record where about uh, 30 paleo Indian sites have been found. And then we began to map them. And then the hardest part was, map, was making a model of the Champlain Sea at its maximum. And we had to use a lot of geological information, uh, new tools like LIDAR. Um, uh, my colleague George Springston, who's a geologist from Norwich, really did an amazing job um, modeling it. And we borrowed a lot of his modeling, as well as some people from SUNY Albany. And we ended up with this map, which is at a gross level, you know, quite accurate. Um, and as you can see, this earliest sort of subperiod from 12,900 to 12,400, there's a, there's a notable, let me go back here, what happened? There's a notable concentration of sites, which I'll go into more detail, right where the Winooski River flowed into uh, the Champlain Sea, which right now is where the big box stores are. And uh, one of the most notable of those three sites was found during um, the archaeology conducted for the Chittenden County Circumferential Highway, most of which was never built. Uh, but a lot of archaeological sites were found during the testing for that, including one found in Williston. Um, and uh, at the time it was excavated, it was really interesting because we didn't really know why it would have been there. It was sort of on a really scrubby, rocky knoll. Um, there wasn't a lot of water near it. Um, again, this is near the Williston Central School. A lot of excavations took place in the late 80s and early 90s at this site. Hundreds of square meters were excavated. And the site was huge, huge. Went over acres, but very, very thinly scattered. Um, very few artifacts per square meter, or even per square 10 meters. Um, and the archaeologists back then, I think, rightly surmised that that's because it was a summer encampment. They didn't need to be isolated inside shelters. They were spreading themselves out over you know, this whole area, this knoll and the surrounding areas, um, and uh, doing various activities. And cumulatively, the, the artifacts that came out from this are really interesting because at this site in Williston, you have material that's all the way from uh, central Pennsylvania, this yellow material. This red material here is from Monsungan Lake in northern Maine. This blue, glossy, almost waxy, candy lit material is from the Hudson Valley. Um, a cumulative straight line distance of roughly 850 kilometers. All stone somehow made its way to the site in Williston, Vermont. And here's a, here's a close-up. So it's a little bit hard to see, but you can see these sites. And this is where the maximum, again, a close-up of where the Champlain Sea is and where the Winooski River would have flowed into it. And it would have been an estuary-like environment, basically where the rivers met the sea, a very biotically productive environment that would have drawn waterfowl and, and terrestrial mammals, marine mammals, mollusks, fish, you know, a, a really great environment. And looking at that, when we look at this site, we can see that it was a little rise, what was above probably, a, you know, a tidal flat or, or you know, a near shore environment, making it great. When you found those tools, did you find chips so that you oh, yeah. they were making them there? Oh, yeah, thousands. So they yeah. were bringing raw materials. Yep. For this yeah, and in fact, it hasn't really been looked at since it was, it was written up and I'm talking with uh, UVM about re-going through the entire collection to really you know, get it up to date. But we have done chemical analysis on the tools and um, petrographic analysis. So it's not just color. We actually know chemically that these were sourced to these particular areas. So then in the next slice, again, we have sites um, you know, corresponding you know, in many cases to the Champlain Sea, including this one here right in the Lamoille River. In the next period, oh, and we also have recently documented sites out of what would have been a peninsula into the Champlain Sea, and even one on an island uh, in the Champlain Sea. Now they're just, um, one, in one case, a hill in Ferrisburg, and in one case, farmland. So you really, as archaeologists, you know, have to project back and imagine what these environments would have looked like, uh, you know, 13,000 years ago. And then um, the next one, again, not many sites known from this subperiod. But one up in Highgate would have been on, on an island-like environment. Although at this point, um, the Champlain Sea had probably receded. So it was probably not an island, but sort of a nearshore environment. Um, and then uh, when we get to this period, we can see uh, sites encroaching on the maximum margins on the Champlain Sea. And why is that? Because the sea was, as the land was coming up, like a sponge you know, being released, 
um, the elevation was coming up and the sea was draining. And so it was getting shallower um, and more land was being exposed. And then finally, by the late Paleo-Indian period, up to about 10,000 or even 9,500, we can see sites really encroaching on the maximum margins of the Champlain Sea so that all of the land except probably the major river deltas, the uh, Missiscoy, Lamoille, and Winooski were available for habitation. So, and just one of those late Paleo-Indian sites in Colchester, again, excavated for the not built circumferential highway. And so what can we say cumulatively about all this? Well, clearly a lot of sites um, are focused on the Champlain Sea, meaning that um, the Champlain Sea was, a, was a, an attraction. It's a place they wanted to situate themselves next. And that might not seem you know, that shocking or revolutionary to you all. We all like to go to the ocean. Um, but, uh, but there has been a consistent sort of narrative that Paleo-Indians were these terrestrial big game hunters killing buffalo and bison and, and mastodon and mammoth and, and caribou and that they weren't really um, focused on marine resources. And it's a bias because all of these environments along the Atlantic or along the Pacific where they would have been along the beaches or along the tidal marshes or along the estuaries are now under you know, 100 plus feet of water uh, because the oceans have been rising. But we, you know, the only landlocked New England state now, conversely, preserve beaches that um, were there at the Pleistocene because our land has been rising. So we have this ironic and very opportunistic um, um, way to study how Paleo-Indians might have utilized marine environments. Now, all of this is sort of circumstantial. You know, I, I say at every lecture that I would love to find you know, the whale skeleton with the spear point in its head um, <laughs> at some point and really say, you know, but that hasn't happened yet, and it's not really likely. So we have to do the best we can with archaeological inference. Um, other features, glacially formed uh, ponds and lakes were extremely important. Um, they were critical sources of fresh water and probably hosted emerging wetland or muskeg environments. And those include Bristol Pond, Moncton Pond, Shelburne Pond, um, uh, Lake Salem, upper in this region. Uh, uh, we're getting close to this region. And then finally, uh, travel corridors. And um, again, the Lake Salem corresponds to one of those. Uh, the, um, the Mad River Valley has a Paleo-Indian site known, not very well understood. And then a very well studied site uh, down in um, uh, at the base of Jackson Gore Mountain in Ludlow, um, in a very narrow valley, um, but one that would have afforded easy travel from the southern uh, uh, Champlain Basin all the way over to the Connecticut. Um, so very interesting. So what, again, my colleagues and I said was, well, we don't know a lot about paleo Indians, but we know they had these diverse, very, very good uh, sources of raw materials from, again, all the way down in Pennsylvania or Monsungan Lake in northern Maine. So uh, what if we modeled how people got to these sources and back? And so uh, our colleague Weatherby at um, University of New Mexico, who's an expert in uh, geographic information systems, or GIS analysis, really complex mapping tools, we developed this protocol where we said, all right, let's factor in um, slope. So you know, um, assuming that people would rather go along places that are flat, or rather than going up and down mountains and hills, um, that they would choose the easiest path, all things being equal. Probable forest cover, which wasn't a lot at, at this time, but would have been an impediment. River flow and direction, its speed, uh, and a couple of other factors. And then we said, factor that in for this entire region, and which is, you know, um, you can imagine, billions of possible combinations. Um, and then we let his giant supercomputer down at the University of New Mexico run. And a couple days later, it came out. And we were really shocked. We did a number of analysis, like from here in Williston to here, here in Williston to here. Um, but the one I'm going to show you is the one from Williston to Monsungan Lake, because it, it really um, opened our eyes, even though it was sort of intuitive once we saw it. And that's that um, while there's a couple interior routes that would have taken you through the greens and the whites and then through the hill and range territory of Upper Maine, they, by far the easiest route would have been just to go along the Champlain Sea, either in watercraft, 
or um, along the river, I mean the winter um, pack ice, which because it was likely frozen over in the winter, down the Etchemin River and then into the west branch of the Penobscot, uh, making it uh, you know far easier to get into these interior territories than we uh, have to do now, particularly if we were on foot. Um, so it was a real eye-opening exercise for us, and it's something that you know we uh, we we uh, write a fair bit about, and you know we're we're continuing to study. So um, from the Paleo Indian period, we move into the Archaic period, and uh, this is a broad sweep of time, roughly 6,000, 6,500 years, uh, which was you know at its you know most reductive was the time of the hunter-gatherer. Um, Fishers, excuse me for a second. And <coughs> there's a lot of things we could talk about, but I'm just gonna spend a little time on a couple aspects that have come up recently. Um, this is a sort of complex graph, but I'll try to break it down for you because it really sets the stage. Um, this is a, um, a graph of calcium concentration in the Greenland ice core GISP2. Sounds kind of complex, but basically calcium uh, in this study is sort of a, a proxy or is an indicator of how crazy the environment was in the past. Mm -hmm. And this is over the last 100,000 years. And of course, they sample the ice very carefully through the last 100,000 years. And, um, and like tree rings, they can see every year going back in these super deep ice cores. And what they can tell is 100,000, 80,000, there's a couple blips. 70,000, there's a big blip, but right around, you know, well, like 68,000 years, things go haywire. And you can see all of these spikes and dips, spikes and dips, spikes and dips, going all the way to the last big spike, which corresponds to the Paleo-Indian period, an event that's called the Younger Dryas. But then, after the Paleo-Indian period, you have this remarkably smooth line, which is roughly the last 11,000 years. And you know, archaeologists being interested in the long term, you know, how humans adapted and, and interacted with th themselves and with the environment, um, really look at that and say, it wasn't that it was warmer, or that it was colder, or that it was wetter, or that it was drier. It's the fact that things were predictable. That you could be reasonably sure that if you found migratory caribou in this area one year, they would come the next year, or in the next decade, or the anadromous fish runs would come up the rivers the next year, or the nuts would ripen at roughly the same time in roughly the same areas. And for a lot of the last 60,000 years, even though we were fully modern humans, you could not count on that. So why would you build a village only to have it be flooded, or be parched, or be, you know, uh, or some other environmental factor a decade from now? You wouldn't invest a lot of time and energy. You'd be moving around the landscape trying to get to where those resources were. So it was this predictability that really set the stage for a lot of the, the cultural dynamism, the, the rise of you know, what is called cities, and, and um, a big term in archaeology, the rise of complexity. So just yeah. before you went, could you talk a little bit about that calcium stuff, I don't Yeah, so um, I don't really understand myself. I just rely on people that are smarter than me. But I think what it is is it's a light element, so it floats up in the atmosphere. So if, if, the, if the weather patterns are complex, if the, if the seas are rough, if there's a lot of you know, um, turbation and turbulence in the environment generally, then more calcium falls onto that ice, which then gets trapped in the ice as it builds up. So it's not from a specific source or? Not that I am aware of. Okay. Although, you know, I've given this talk a lot, so I should probably know. <laughs> so I, I, I'm going to get on the Google tonight. <laughs> um, and again, it was a remarkably um, stable time, the last 11,000 years or so. But there were ups and downs. Here's a crazily complex graph. But all you need to know is the black line shows after around 11,000 years ago, you get a rise in temperature. And then there's some spikes. And sometimes we can see in those spikes and dips different things happening, uh, even here in Vermont, uh, corresponding to different things. And if we have time, I'll get to some of those. And again, the environment. Um, cumulatively, when we study a lot of these things, we can see how things have changed over the last 21,000, in this case, years. Um, even subtle changes mean different forest compositions changing through time. Again, as we can tick through, I'll show you. You know, again, the rise of mixed woodland moving north, 
tundra going further north as the glaciers recede, and then finally getting to where we are now. And how do we, how do we understand that? Well, one of, the, one of the ways that geologists and other environmental science study um, plant change in the past is this really, really laborious process um, called sediment coring, where you basically just take a big, huge hollow tube, go out uh, to a pond or a, a wetland or a, a lake, and then plunge it into the bottom of the sediment um, and pull it up and then uh, cut it in half and then, like a tree ring, look at all of, of the, the sediment that's fallen into the lake or river in any given year. And in a good core, you can see almost every year through time or, or packets going up through time. And um, in several deep cores, you can go back all the way 11,000 years ago. And then, if, if that seems laborious, then at various stages along the core, they count individual pollen grains and um, look at them under a microscope to see what species they came from. And from all of that, and they also have to do radiocarbon dating so they can see how far along they're going through time. But from that, you can get these really cool graphs. So like this is birch. So you can see around 11,000 years ago, there's a spike in birch, then there's a dip, then it's pretty much solid. Uh, uh, conversely, pine goes through the roof and then kind of drops down. These, and these have been rarely done in Vermont. This is from Sterling Pond, and this is from Ritterbush Pond. Um, so a couple of the cores that have shown, at least in an area around the pond, the differences in tree species through time by that pollen counting. Why would you have picked those particular pines? Because they're the only two that have been done. Oh, why would the geologists? Yeah. Um, because, that's a good question. I think because they're, uh, um, they were kind of easy to get to, um, and they were high altitude. Um, so there hasn't been a lot of eutrophication, basically meaning inflows from you know, um, you know, uh, modern you know, 19th century clear cutting and a lot of siltation and eutrophication and you know, pollution and all that stuff. But the problem with high altitude is it gives you a skewed look at what the environment would have looked like. And that's actually a great segue into this slide, because Vermont also has a really interesting altitudinal gradient to our forests. Up until about 1,800 feet, we have mixed forests, you know, the beautiful fall foliage. But right about 1,800 feet, it turns into boreal forest, coniferous forest. And you can see that whenever you look around. And then on the highest peaks, including here at Camel's Hump, there used to be more Mount A, uh, uh, um, Camel's Hump, Mount Mansfield, a couple others, preserve um, the tundra-like environment that was around uh, 13,000, 11,000 years ago. Um, so literally, when you're hiking up these mountains, you're sort of um, forest community speaking, going back through time, all the way up into the Pleistocene. And uh, another really interesting thing, for those of you who are uh, interested in forest cover, um, or you know, our environmentalists, is this, this uh, gentleman whose last name is Cogbill, and I forget his first name. But uh, he and colleagues did this remarkable thing where um, Charlie. Hmm? Charlie. Charlie. Charlie Cogbill. They, he, um, he knew that in founding uh, documents for any particular town and the first lot surveys, before uh, stone walls were built and permanent markers, they would take a tree, a, a good sturdy old tree in the corner of the lot, in most corners of lots, and say, OK, this is a witness tree. It's this chestnut tree in this corner of the lot. It's this elm in this corner of the lot. So uh, Charlie and uh, colleagues went through all the original lot markers for 760 towns throughout New England to see what the trees were like um, back at the time of the first surveys. Remarkable, you know, ridiculous <laughs> amount of effort. So impressive. And, um, you can't really tell any from, from, from this graph, so I, I made another graph which tells it. Um, but Well, one thing I'd like to show is that this red, which is predominant here, is maple. But in the, in the pre-clear cutting and then regrowth, beech was by far the dominant tree species in Vermont, 36%. And then maples, and then spruce, hemlock, birches, ashes. And then oak was you know, quite rare going down to chestnut, almost non-existent, butternut, almost non-existent, and then various things. So what I did a couple of years ago uh, with uh, uh, a colleague, Brett Ostrom, who worked with me for a couple of years on a temporary basis, uh, and I have to give her a ton of credit with this, was I had one of these harebrained ideas where I said, Brett, Brett, we have like 40 years of archaeological surveys where we've done all this 
analysis of uh, botanical remains and, and, and food remains, let's go through every report and see what people reported. And she was like, <laughs> and I was like, OK. But uh, a year and a half later, we did it. And surprisingly, I thought there would be this wealth of information. But actually, it's not that huge of a, of a corpus of data, which just shows how much more we need to know. A lot of that is due to preservation. And how did we get this data? Well, um, things like this, which is like a roughly 5,000-year-old, um, the remains of a fire pit by Native Americans. You can see all the firecraft rock here. We would take this dark soil, run it through very fine flotation and mesh, take all the little bits, send it to an expert who can identify them under a microscope. And this is very impressionistic. These aren't percentages. These are actually incidences. And we're running some statistics on it now. But what we can see at a general level is that it mirrors the, the contact period for us. And you can see we have a lot of data up till about 5,000 years ago. And then our data falls off a cliff. Sites become rarer af after, before that point. So that's a factor. But it also appears that preservation, even when we get lucky, in most cases lasts about 5,000 years. And after that, things get very dicey. Um, but when we have data, we can see beach is prominent in every one of the things. And, and, and maple, oftentimes, there's some blips down here low. Um, but overall, the forest composition roughly mirrors uh, what we see in the contact period for the last 5,000 so, years. Yeah. Yes, are you using um, pollen again? No, no, no. These are actual. Um, bits of the wood, firewood, essentially. Oh, okay. What they would have, yeah. And because um, you know they didn't chop down giant trees and then buck them up because they had stone axes. And if you've ever tried to chop anything down with a stone axe, it is not easy. So uh, until agriculture came, uh, you know what we surmise is that most of the wood that they gathered was dead wood, which in that case means that the wood probably represents some area around the site. They weren't ranging far away for particular wood species. You know, they were just gathering the firewood that was around their particular encampment. But then when it gets burned, some of it, enough of it gets like just stuck. Charred. Yeah, and charred. charring is the thing that preserves it. We wouldn't, it wouldn't last 10 years if it wasn't charred. But charring changes the chemical composition enough so that it can preserve, in some cases, up to about 5,000 years old. And then what happens is we send it to these people that actually look under a microscope. And from the porosity and the different pores and channels and things, they can say, yeah, this is burnt uh, maple. But you know, the fragments are sometimes that small. You know, um, Nut species is another thing I'll just go through quickly. Um, here's the, the major species of edible nuts in Vermont, beech nut, hazelnut, butternut, which is a walnut species, hickory nuts, acorns. And uh, we looked at all of the incidences of uh, nut remains that have been found. Again, not a whole lot. Um, but what we see is really interesting. Butternut is uh, probably intuitively, you'd think it's delicious. People love walnuts. Uh, they're the highest incidence in all, almost all, or I think every category. Um, and beech nuts, which are 30% of the entire tree species, are quite rare. Now, I've never eaten a beech nut because I'm allergic to nuts, but I have to assume that they're just gross. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, really? It's like a, a, if you had a green kernel of corn, yeah. or it's, like, it's like corn, corn white. Well, that's interesting because um, part of what we have to surmise archaeologically is it's like corn. Corn only preserves if people essentially make a mistake. It falls out. It gets burned before it gets mashed into powder, uh, into flour. And if, if it gets mashed into power, powder or flour, we will never find it archaeologically. That's why we have to rely on the shells. But the shells, there's very little beech shell. And often what these are represented by, it's, it's rare to find nut meat. We find the shells. Um, but in any case, butternut, if you flash back to those tree species, cogbills and earlier, Butternut is exceedingly rare in the overall forest canopy, which means Native Americans were going out of their way to find butternuts. You know, it's no surprise, they're delicious, but probably had something to do with how they mapped themselves onto the landscape through time. So through this, we can at least get a little idea about how people moved about in Vermont. More work to come. Um, let's see, I got 20 minutes left, so I'm going to skip. Let's just jump through 6,000 years of history. <laughs> and um, uh, let's see. We will get to 
You found a, um, or, or someone found it in, it was in the in the bridge, uh, a copper, Ooh. a copper as, oh. <laughs> I was going to ask you where, what period that was from. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I will um, actually uh, talk a little bit about that. So, um, this uh, I was just telling uh, Carol and Carol. Uh, this uh, was found in Lake Salem, um, and uh, a gentleman contacted me. He was metal detecting underwater, which I didn't even know was a thing. Um, <laughs> but um, he contacted me and said he had found this, and uh, it was made of copper because it was his machine was beeping for copper, and he wanted to know what it was. And I, you know, I felt bad about it, but I said, you know, um, navigable waterways, things found in it that are older than 10 years are property of the state of Vermont. I'm sorry about that. You know, that's ours. And he was not that happy about it. But, uh, but he was very good, and he just said, you know, is it going to help? Is it, is, it a, is it something important? I said, it's one of the most important things I've ever seen in Vermont. Um, and so he was very great. His name was Ken Jordan. I, I have to give him all the credit in the world. I went up there. He showed me right where it's found, documented the thing. And, and now it's at the Heritage Center, preserved for all of you to see. After that bridge article, a number of people came to see it, and I, I showed it. Um, and why is it remarkable? Well, um, it, uh, oftentimes when these are found, um, these are found in uh, Native American burials, which we don't really excavate anymore. Um, and, uh, and so they were clearly precious goods. But this area in Lake Salem, uh, I talked with uh, some uh, Native American folks up there, the chief and uh, another Native American, and we agreed it, um, it wasn't an area that would have been a, a burial. In fact, um, it would have been underwater even 3,000 years ago. And so what this likely represents is an overboard loss. And, um, and it, it's made of copper. And Native Americans uh, in North America, um, or north of Mesoamerica, didn't uh, have smelting technology. They didn't have the ability to melt down copper and then reform it in the, in the uh, or maybe they had the ability and just chose not to. Uh, but in any case, we don't see it in the archaeological record in this region. So they had to rely on chemically pure, um, macroscopic, or very large drift copper. And there's only two places where you can get that, two major places in this region, Lake Superior and Nova Scotia. And um, Native Americans would trade all across the eastern woodlands for, from these two sources. And we haven't done any chemical testing on this yet, but it's probably from one of those two sources. And made its way through trade all the way to Lake Salem, where it probably went overboard and, and someone was probably very upset. Um, and um, it's also remarkable uh, because it's characteristic flaring bit end. You can even see the, the cold hammering on it and how they were hammering bits into it. Um, uh, dates probably about 3,000 years ago. Uh, a time that we call the early woodland period. And most remarkably, because it was in this lake bottom anaerobic or non-oxidizing mud, it's like, you know, probably the day it was made. Um, and that never, most of the time when these are recovered, these are, you know, corroded green with verdigris, just like copper does, you know, from a copper roof. Um, you know, you can see that 10 or 15 years, imagine 3,000 years. You know, there's usually barely anything left. So this is a really, really, remarkable um, uh, artifact. Uh, tells a great story about trade and exchange. Um, and uh, I'm actually looking into, um, I've got it carefully packaged and preserved, but I'm looking into actually putting it in nitrogen so it won't um, you know, oxidize more. Can you tell a little bit about its use? And yeah, yeah um, it, we don't really know what they were used for. I, we've got to imagine that these were more um, precious items. They were probably preserved. Um, we, don't, we know that they weren't ceremonial or religious in every case. Um, they, were, they were probably used um, for non-utilitarian purposes. So they wouldn't chop down a tree with them. But they might um, process plants with them or um, perhaps use them in feasts or uh, do other things that, you know, um, you still required a sharp edge, but wouldn't, you wouldn't destroy it right away. How thick is that? It's, I mean, it's about uh, that thick, that thin, that, you know. Here's centimeters, but you know. But, um, uh, but we're just looking at the side. The of sides. Side so this is the bit end, and this yep. is quite sharp. And um, and then maybe it was only a quarter or a third of an inch. Third of an inch. Yep. Okay. So th thin. Thin. Yep. Yeah. Yep. But sturdy. I mean, it's when you pick it up, it's heavy. Yeah. 
you know, so. When you say these are rare, like they found a dozen of them or a hundred of them or? In Vermont? In, in, in New England, maybe. Oh, New England, uh, I would say a hundred of them maybe. Mm -hmm. um, maybe less. Probably less. Um, you know, and, and a lot of these, like there's numerous examples of these, um, again, more corroded in like um, the uh, UVM's collection from, you know, the Fleming Museum. But we don't know where they came from. You know, we have no idea where they came from. So they, they lose their interpretive and archaeological and explanatory value. Um, Do they have a name? Uh, they're called Celts. Basically, or adzes. Celts or adzes. Okay. Their name. I, I just. Uh, yeah, C L C E L T, and an adz is is uh, yeah yeah exactly yeah. Um, but I'm going to jump ahead. Um, so yeah. You're finding other copper artifacts. Very rarely. Yeah. No, almost almost mm -hmm. never. Um, you know, outside of um, uh, there, there's a few copper artifacts that were found in an excavation at Shelburne Pond. Once you get up to um, the late woodland and um, uh, like the beginnings of European contact, then you find a lot of copper artifacts. Uh, but pre-contact, pre-European copper, uh, very rare. Um, and it's just because uh, we're you know in a very um, in inauspicious area to get copper. You know, down uh, from the Mississippi, from the Great Lakes, down in the major trade routes. Copper is very common at the same time period. Um, but it wasn't easy to get to uh, Lake Superior, and it wasn't easy to get to Nova Scotia. So it becomes rarer and rarer. And, and we you know, um, surmise that you know, as the distance to the source becomes rarer and rarer and rarer, uh, it gets more precious and valuable and valuable. You know? um, and it's, it's difficult to ascribe a sort of secular practical value on these things. But assuredly, you know, that, that's what took place. When was this discovered? Last year. Wow. Yeah. Big. Yeah, big it was day. big. I, I wrote a little thing in the in the Montpelier Bridge um, that this was one of the artifacts mm -hmm. we talked about, and um, yeah, so it was it was uh, it was neat. You know, it was it was out of the blue, and now it's <coughs> preserved and available. You know, um, not on display, but people can come and look at it if they want. Where did you find it? And where was it found? Lake Salem. Lake yeah, which is actually, you know, an amazing little lake. A lot of remarkable things have been found. I don't encourage any of you to go out digging. Please don't. Where, where is, uh, that? Where is that? Uh, that's in, uh, is it in Der Sutton Derby. or Derby? or Derby. Derby. Oh, way up there. Yeah. yeah. And when was your article? Ugh. I don't know. Time ceases to have a lot 2017, of meetings. Uh, I think it was 2018. I have it at home. Yeah. Maybe I'll let Great. So uh, let me just, you know, I, I, I'll just give a quick anecdote about trade and exchange that comes from um, George Catlin, who's a problematic figure uh, in, in studying Native Americans. But he has this uh, anecdote in one of his books that I came across when I was in grad school, and it, and it really highlights uh, it's something about Native American uh, exchange. Not that it's equivalent out, out west or in the plains to here where he was, but um, he said, well, out where he was, in one of the areas he was, um, they, had, um, they had wooden uh, bows. And they were the, you know, uh, for bows and arrows. And he said they were, the, they were the sort of least valued everyday utilitarian. And um, if, you, if you, you know, saved up enough or had enough prestige or had whatever means necessary, you could get sort of a ram horn bow which was much more precious, highly valued. Not only you know, was it a better bow, but had a lot of social capital attached to it, had prestige attached to it. And he said the greatest bows were these white big bows made out of one piece of wood, uh, one piece of material. And uh, the people on where they were getting them, I think he was talking about the Blackfoot, had no idea what the material was. They just knew that it was the most sacred, special, highly valued, rare material. And what they actually were were whale rib bones. But they were over the mountains and in the sea that they had never seen before. But they were traded down the line. And if you had enough prestige capital, you could get one of these. And you had no idea where it was from, but it, it, it meant a lot. You know? And I, I, that anecdote comes back to me a lot with um, trade and exchange in these early times, that you didn't even know exactly where the source of some of these things were. You just knew that as it went along the line, it 
gained more and more value, social prestige, social capital, um, and probably cost a lot more in whatever sense that, that meant. So last 10 minutes. Uh, the late woodland period is the final period in archaeological parlance uh, before European contact. And it dates roughly about 1,000 years ago to the time of European contact, which I round to about 400 calendar years ago. And um, around this time, archaeologically, we can begin to see archaeological signatures of uh, the tribal entities that were around at the time of European contact. So here in most of Vermont, uh, the Western Abnaki, across uh, the lake, the Mohawk, um, Eastern Abnaki in a lot of Maine, and then Maliseet, Passamaquoddy, Micmac. Um, and at right around this time, um, corn, beans, squash, uh, agriculture finally begins to be adopted. Why had it not been adopted beforehand? It's, a, it's, a, it's a, an interesting question and one that a lot of archaeologists spend their time on the world over. Because you, know, you might have this idea, maybe some of you are farmers, that farming is great. It, it quote unquote civilized people, uh, brought people together. But actually, uh, farming when it's adopted in any given era, area is horrible for people. Um, you know, people have studied hunter-gatherers around the world, and yes, occasionally there would be periodic times of, of malnutrition and stress if, if something they were going after didn't appear or if there's uh, drought or something like that. But most of the time, being a hunter-gatherer was great. You work an hour or two a day in terms of work, going out, get it, food getting, processing, whatever. The rest of the time, you had yourself. It was fantastic. And your nutrition was great. No cavities, you know, you had a well-rounded nutrition, particularly in this part of the world where you're not relying upon one species or a, a few key species. And then archaeologically, in every area where, where corn, bean, squash is adopted in eastern woodland, for the vast majority of people, nutrition plummets, cavities and abscesses in, in the mouth and all sorts of nutritional st stress emerge. People are working harder because now you've got to tend to your crops and plant them and keep the animals off. And, uh, and yeah, and all of a sudden you're working, you know, you're what, a 40 hour or more a week um, and your nutrition is going down. So why do people do it? And it's an interesting question archaeologically because not just here in North America, but across the world, you see it happen and happen almost everywhere. And Again, about 1,000 AD, it happened up here uh, in, in, in Vermont. We don't know if every group in Vermont adopted agriculture, but we can see signatures of it in almost all the major river valleys. Um, one of the most prominent areas is the Intervale area in Burlington, which had a light presence before the woodland period. And it's difficult to study because it's so far down in the flood layers. You have to go you know, 12 feet down to find some of these things. Um, but as Corn bead squash gets adopted. Uh, the intensity of occupation down in the Intervale really skyrockets. A ton of archaeological sites down there. Um, and again, in this uh, survey of all of the plant remains that we found, obviously we can see uh, around 1000 AD, corn bean squash uh, really emerge. Um, but interestingly, a few plants, which don't require a lot of effort to grow, uh, that archaeologists call the Eastern Agricultural Complex, which they include marsh elder, may grass, um, sump weed, uh, amaranth. Um, they were, began to be grown about 3,500 years ago in the Ohio Valley. And we can see that about 2,500 years ago, up in Swanton, we have sunflower seeds documented. So people were growing. They, were, they weren't growing this intensive plants, but they were probably had garden plots um, early on. Here's what uh, uh, you know, uh, 900 year old corn looks like when it's found. Uh, looks like corn, just you know, if you left it on the burner a little too long. <laughs> um, and then up above the falls in Burlington, uh, a really interesting site that was excavated a number of years ago uh, for an expansion of the um, of the National Guard base. Um, it was found to be vulnerable to attack, so they had to put everything behind a fence. Um, <laughs> And a uh, and, and neat little, um, uh, not little, quite huge uh, for Vermont standards, agricultural village uh, was found. Um, roughly 200 meters was excavated, which is a big excavation in Vermont terms. Um, roughly concentrated where the road was going to go. Everything else was preserved. We worked to preserve everything else. Um, so two kind of loci. Um, I'll skip through some of these. Um, 
but a lot of corn was found here. This is a great, um, this was a great uh, image, and it's difficult to see, but this black sort of mat that goes through it, and then these dark areas, these are all the remains of storage pits and fire pits. And then this black mat on top of it is where um, people lived so intensely, dropping their food and you know, doing whatever, that it organically enriched the soil, like potting soil. So you can see it's, it roughly translates to the inside of a shelter. They're probably living in there over the winter, and you know, through that course of that tromping down the ground, they just in organically enrich the soil. And then right above that, here's the road fill for National Guard Road. And so you can see the beer bottle sticking out. <laughs> so we got very lucky that it preserved just that layer before it got stripped off for the road. And so we mapped. And you know, like a lot of archaeology that's done in Vermont, we can't pick and choose where we want to excavate. It's done because the areas are going to be destroyed or impacted. So we have this sort of slanty line, when, but we think that the house went something like this. Um, probably a long house. You know, uh, 50,000 artifacts, I believe, came out of this excavation, the majority of which were the remains of stone tool making and other things, just little chips, but um, an array of patterns. So um, fire hearth, fire hearth, fire hearth, fire hearth, storage pit, storage pit. And one of these classic bell-shaped um, storage pits uh, for storing corn that, um, that really defines late woodland storage. Um, the other locusts, you know, showing a heat map of where the artifacts are. And all of these triangles are um, the, the arrowheads or triangular uh, projectile points that we found, um, kind of hundreds of them. So overall, a really interesting agricultural village. We concentrated here and here, but all of these blue dots are uh, test pits that had Native American artifacts in them. So a huge, probably, village uh, up above the Missisquoi River. And this site is great because it's the only site I've ever seen in Vermont where we ran five radiocarbon dates, one on butternut, one, two on maize, um, and one on hop hornbeam. And they all came out to the exact same date, which is 1310 AD, give or take a little bit. So a late woodland, um, uh, probably winter habitation, up above uh, the, the Winooski River. And interestingly, all, almost all the wood that was found here was pitch pine, which is, um, used to be at the, uh, um, yeah, it's very sandy there. Used to be, um, bef before the 19th century, um, very common in uh, this area of the Champlain Valley. And now there's less than, I think, 300 acres of pitch pine forest left in Vermont. Uh, but it was a very common forest type. And we could see that, again, through the archaeological remains. Well, why do you think it was winter? Because of the density, well, that's a good question. There was a lot of things that went into that assumption. Uh, and a lot of it was the density of artifacts in the, the house patterns and not a lot outside of it. Also that they were up off the floodplain. Um, so that a lot of the corn we think they were eating was actually stored corn and was brought up. Um, and also there's interesting things like um, there was a little layer of clay over all of it, which appears to, they have purposely capped the site after they left it, probably in the spring. Um, and uh, you know various things that we looked at, like wind direction, it would have been sheltered from the wind, which is something, that, and the prevailing elements. Basically, if you imagine that big terrace that goes up to the, where the National Guard base is now, it was down in the sort of lee of that. So all of these things led us to think that it was um, a, a winter habitation. Um, so again, sort of a longhouse design emerging from the earlier sort of bark wi wigwams into longhouse designs, and then I'll, I'll finish in the last few minutes with probably the most extraordinary excavation that's gone on in Vermont in a generation, and that was up in Swanton for the proposed um, expansion of uh, Route 78, uh, kind of a dangerous stretch of highway, but it, it, it actually goes over um, you know, one of the most intensely occupied areas of Vermont, at least as, as far as we know archaeologically. Um, the area of the Missisquoi Abnaki now, obviously, still considered their, their um, ho homeland, heartland, and, and just absolutely remarkable. And, it, and why is it remarkable? Well, for a number of factors. But one of them is that um, floodplains uh, preserve archaeological uh, material like no other environment in Vermont. Because what happens is, uh, say, 7,000 years ago, which is the earliest evidence here, uh, people come, they live on a surface, they do what they do, they leave eventually, then there's a flood. That drops sediment, it caps it. Then 100 years, however many years later, another group comes, they do the same thing, caps it. 
So through time, which I'll show you in a minute, you get this layer cake or chapter book that goes all the way up. And with these, every lens going down is a discrete occupation. Now, the, the, what I want to show you here is the green, um, which is late woodland. And what we can see from changes in the artifacts is that um, by the late woodland, or about 1,000 years ago, they were, Native Americans were really pushing out into the delta. Um, where they had sort of kept into the more stable uh, landforms further back towards what is now downtown Swanton. Um, they're really pushing out in the delta, and that's probably related to an expansion of corn fields. Um, and also because the delta is becoming more stable. Um, so it's difficult to see, but it just looks like, you know, uh, a thousand layer cake. And every one of those layers is an occupation. In one of the um, test pits that they excavated, um, which was, I think, dated to 3,400 years old. Um, there was a the fire pit, and um, it still smelled like fish. Um, just <laughs> absolutely remarkable preservation. And um, the Cisco Abnaki worked on this project alongside the archaeologists, so it was just a great um, experience all around. So many aspects. We had 1,900 visitors over the course of the project at this site, really great. Um, it was just the confluence of all these great factors. Yes, before you go on, yeah. could you just tell us real quickly what happens? You start with ground, OK? Yes. I mean, I'm, I'm intrigued by the, the straightness of the cuts and, and where does That's, all the stuff go? And people, people ask um, about that stuff all the time. How do you get it so straight? What tools do you use? Yeah, and, and I, I say peer pressure. The tools, but um, <laughs> what do you do with that soil? What do you? Yeah, so it's a great question. So. Things get straight by um, uh, heckling the new people in your crew until you make straight walls. Uh, and that is true. And uh, you can probably attest to that, though. Um, and what do you do with the soil? Well, this was an enormous excavation, 400 square meters. But the, every one of those dark lenses that they would go through, they would sample a bit, um, screen the rest through fine mesh to find artifacts. And then that sample, they would run through a flotation, basically cheesecloth to capture any things which were then subsequently looked through. We're still waiting for the final results of the report, but the results they got through even the, um, what we call phase two, or sort of middle range stuff that they did a number of years ago, has blown our minds. It's really um, increased our knowledge about um, Native Americans in this part of Vermont, you know, more than any other excavation. But do you check every cubic centimeter of that? That pit, or I mean, when, every. as you take this stuff out, is every. Yeah, I mean, we don't, we don't, you know. I mean, you, we you we screen it. it. We screen it. Yeah, right. Through right. through screens. But that yeah. whole volume. Four hundred square meters. Right. So okay. where does all that soil go after you screen? Goes it back in the holes after we. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is that one summer's work? Uh, I think that was two years worth of work. Yeah, and it was it was hard. It was. Um, they're right next to the road because, yeah. and so there had to be a flagger, and you know there was a couple close calls where people who had you know hit happy hour drove off the road or pretty near <laughs> some excavation units, and you know, um, and again pottery, and I'm a little bit over, but I just want to show you this last thing more because it took me a long time to make more than anything else, <laughs> um, and um, it's difficult to see, especially in this light, but. Um, that site on uh, National Guard Road was likely an Algonquian-style uh, multifamily longhouse. But this uh, up here um, in, um, in Swanton is the real first definitive pattern of a longhouse we have. It's very difficult to see, but I'll help you out in a second with that. Um, these multiple lines of pits going all the way around, coming down, coming over here. And this was on federal land in the Missisquoi Wildlife Refuge. And um, they are very careful on the refuge about what gets disturbed or not. So the compromise came. I think they sampled a one or two of these fire hearths, just took little bits of um, soil out for radiocarbon dating. And then they got down to here, this level, which is basically just taking the modern plow zone off, photographed it, and put it back. So it's all still there, preserved. But this is a, a sort of recreation of what it would have looked like. And again. It just took a while, so I'm going to show it to you. I show it everywhere I go. So this is what it would have approximately looked like. That's where one of the fire hearths would have been. And then, again, the, infra, the sort of superstructure of the longhouse would have been covered in bark. Um, and then this is what it would have looked like inside. Now, obviously, I didn't recreate every post and beam in this thing. You know, Archaeology is rarely that precise. But just to give you an idea of what it would have looked like, 
Um, nice work. Yeah, it took a while. <laughs> um, and then coming out again and then stripping it all off. Um, and this, although I think it probably dates earlier, is pretty much the exact location of um, what has been called Greylock's Castle, which was um, you know, the early historic Missiscoy uh, village um, going into the 17, you know, beginning around the 1730s, but at least as far as we know, but going into the 1780s and 90s. Um, again, I think this dates earlier than that, but it just shows you the sort of relived on landscape through time, going back 7,000 years. And with that, I'll, I'll stop. Do the families live in the longhouse? Yeah. They, it's, they each have their own little section of it? Yeah, and it's, it's interesting because um, a lot of our analogies come from Iroquois mm -hmm. uh, longhouses, which were multifamily, and they were segmented. So, so usually there'd be some um, uh, sort of super family relationship, either extended family uh, uh, or clan-based. But you, you'd have your little segment of the longhouse, like, each of which had a fire and a hole in the chimney and um, you know, sort of bunks and, and everything. Um, Algonquin longhouses, we presume it was more or less the same, although how they decided who got to be in a longhouse is, is, is not well understood, particularly in Vermont. In Maine, there's some analogs at Norwich Walk, some early Je Jesuit missions that we can look at for analogs, but still quite new. All right, thanks. Oh, yeah, go for it. I know there's been uh, more about the dispute about the Mohawk presence on the east side of the Lake Champlain. Do you see any evidence? Of Not really, and I mean, that was, you know... Can I, you reiterate the question? Yeah, so um, is there presence of, um, of Mohawks on the eastern side, basically the Vermont side of Lake Champlain? And archaeologically, uh, almost none. In fact, Supposedly, there was a Mohawk um, pot found from a site called the River Site in Ferrisburg, but I don't know when that dates to. It could have dated post-European contact. So pre-European contact, almost none. There is some Iroquoian-esque pottery from a group that um, we really only know archaeologically. There's, there was only one um, explorer that ever contacted them, Cartier. By the time the next explorer came down, they were all gone. Um, and whether it was disease or the Mohawk or some combination of um, conflict, it's a big question in archaeology, they were gone. Um, and we do see some of that pottery, particularly in northern Lake Champlain, uh, but I am of the opinion that it was Algonquian potters um, just sort of um, not copying but uh, adopting a sort of broad uh, style of pottery that was just sort of in vogue in the, in the eastern woodlands at that time. But no Mohawk pottery. Um, and so archaeologically, um, once you get into the late 1700s, uh, or even the mid-1700s, yes, you, you can see Mohawk incursions, basically you know, captive narratives and all those things. They're coming across the lake. They went to Brandon. They went to various places. But there's no evidence of a sustained Mohawk population. Um, now, once you get into the 1800s, you can see them in the records start to petition for land grievances. Mm -hmm. But it's not at all clear that you know, those um, reflected at least archaeological reality. And the, and the record, the historical record in this region, up to about 1800, is very scatty and uh, spotty. And, but obviously, after European contact, and particularly you know, um, once the Beaver Wars got going and the Mohawk had, you know, and all the Iroquois, you know, had a massive expansionist sort of move to capture a lot of the, the um, you know, fur trade. You know, things got very dynamic. Um, but prior to that, archaeologically, prior to European contact, we don't see it archaeologically. Conversely, do you see an Algonquian presence on the west side of the lake? Uh, I'm, I'm less familiar, but <clears throat> certainly yes. I mean, um, uh, there is that, again, that St. Lawrence Iroquoian pottery on the, on the, um, New York side of the lake, at least in the Plattsburgh area that I know of. Um, but uh, the New York side of the lake is very, um, I don't want to say poorly, but lightly studied. A lot of that is because um, in, the, in the middle and southern regions, there's almost no lake shore. It pretty much goes, there's a little bench which has been thoroughly built on since the 1700s, you know, uh, and then the mountains. 
Um, and it's not like our vast Champlain Valley on this side. So a lot of the areas that were available for study once upon a time, where Native Americans lived and you know, would have been available once upon a time, are now built over. And then once you get to the northern part of Lake Champlain, this sort of um, Shazy area, it's just almost terra incognita. No, no, nothing's been studied. We know very little. And that's probably where you know, um, the Mohawk area was probably the most intense. Um, but we know very little about it. But certainly Algonquian presence on the New York side of the lake is, is quite clear up through what I would term the late woodland period. Getting down to those time slices of like 1400, 1500, I'm, I'm not that familiar on that side of the state. The Mohawk. Yeah, go ahead, Carl. The, the Mohawk migration story that they came from way off in the southwest, and when they got to the Long Lake, there was another people already here. Mm -hmm. And that's why they stopped on the west side of the lake. The yeah. ones already here were the evident. And, you know, there's some, you know, not to go on, but, you know, it's, this was called the Lake Between. Yeah. It was a pretty firm boundary, and it was recognized as such, at least, like I said, until the Mohawk became very expansionist. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, there's some interesting things about the, the creation myth of Otsiozo, mm -hmm. or Rock Dunder in Lake Champlain. And um, you know, that's an Algonquian myth. And then you can see that the, the Mohawks sort of call it Rotzio, which is sort of like a mischaracterized version of Otsiozo, like they're adopting it later on. I mean, that's my own interpretation. I, you know, I'm not a linguist. Mm -hmm. But all of these things, you sort of attest to the Algonquian presence on the on the eastern side of Lake Champlain, up to and including early contact, again, until this expansionist mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. I watch way too much National Geographic television. That's all right. The technology fascinates me with the LIDAR and all that. It seems like the state is reactive. Something's going to happen here, so we better go in and check it out. Do you ever see the day when you could say, We've never explored there. Let's fly a plane over it. And oh, well, flying plane, yeah. I mean, LIDAR, it, uh, it, I, um, I have to give all the credit in the world to, A, the legislature, and B, to my colleagues at the Vermont Center for Geographic Information. We're in the lead, you know, one of the leaders nationally, in getting full state LIDAR coverage. Uh, and we will be there in about a year. In fact, um, you can look in most areas of the state right now, and I forget which counties. I think it's Windsor and probably Essex County. Uh, maybe Essex is done. But almost the entire area is flown with sub, um, sub-foot LIDAR. And so it's, it's mind-blowing for archaeologists. In most cases, Native Americans um, left a kind of light footprint. Um, and, but you can see a few things, you know, which I don't want to really elaborate on. Um, but because um, most of them, I think, are burial sites. Um, but historically, I mean, uh, stone walls and foundations and I mean you can see furrows in you know farm fields and it's 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 mind-blowing it's absolutely game-changing and for my colleagues that work in other parts of the world where there's temples and you know I mean it sees through the forest canopy so you know it's uh, I have a lot of colleagues and in fact you know I've done some work in the Brazilian Amazon and they fl every time they fly LIDAR over there it just is mind-blowing I mean has anything shown up that you're saying to yourself oh, I can't wait to go check that out well you know um, I have to you know iterate and perhaps this is my first time saying this that I'm a preservationist and so um, uh, if it can be preserved I want it to be preserved if it, if it you know um, certainly I'm also an archaeologist so I'm interested in the stories that um, artifacts and archaeological sites tell but there's a, there's, there's a lot of them that have been excavated. Um, and so, you know, there's no shortage of uh, narratives that are in those boxes for us to look at. And, and um, so we concentrate on the areas that are going to be destroyed. You know, that, yes. that um, now having said that, you saw that map with the eastern part of the state, where especially areas west of the Connecticut, it's like there's nothing known. And so, um, you know, we at the state do think long term that some sort of survey in the eastern part of the state to understand what's going on there archaeologically is important. Um, but, you know, we spend a lot of time, you know, trying to get it, you know, keep up with the next thing and the next thing. And so, you know, um, we work with a lot of people. I always encourage um, interested 
um, graduate students, people that care about um, uh, the Abnaki, anyone who has an interest to come to and look at these materials and to check them out, to learn from them, hopefully to get um, you know, graduate papers or you know, other scholarly papers or even just a, you know, a, a, you know, like the Intervale. We work a lot with the Intervale to just understand better the deep history of the farming there you know, because it's such an important farming hub there, things like that. Um, and all of that feeds into then um, an appreciation for the deep history of Native Americans in the state and, and an appreciation for um, archaeology in general. Because it, you know, I, I sometimes say this, uh, archaeology um, used to be very uh, prominent in the Northeast. A lot of the Ivy Leagues had um, archaeology or anthropology programs with an archaeological component. And they, they did a lot of their work in the Northeast. A lot of it was Iroquoian studies, but still, it was, a, it was an area. Now that interest has moved into Mesoamerica and South America and, and other areas. And, and uh, you know, there's very few graduate students that are interested in the, in the you know, deep and important history of this region. So the more that we can do to, to sort of you know, um, say, hey, people were here. They were important. They, you know, they have stories to tell. Come and research the stuff. I think the better off we're all going to be as as Vermonters. Yeah. Uh, Twenty or twenty-five years ago, Eleanor Ott, a local person, gave us a walk of a walkthrough of a of an old farmhouse site, and we started saying, "Well, when are you going to dig it up?" And she said, "We don't do that anymore." <laughs> and now you're talking about preservation versus archaeology, or there's a difference, or it's a all the side of the same same coin. And part of preservation is, um, is yeah, I mean, you know, I, I wouldn't say we don't do that anymore. It's just we try not to do it if it's not going to be, you know, destroyed for some other reason or impacted for some other reason. And particularly historic, um, you know, uh, archaeological sites, um, a lot of it can be done non-destructively. Mapping the outlines of the foundation. Where is the chimney? Um, how are the, the walls arrayed and the compound arrayed? A lot of that can tell you really interesting stuff about the time period, the ethnicity of the people that did that, how they were learning to make their, a lot of things they were bringing over and have a lot of details. The artifacts certainly fill in that historic story, but you have to have a really um, good, what we call research design to understand what you're doing before you're, you're gonna put a lot of holes in the ground. The other reason why you know, we say we're preservationists is, um, you know, Warren Moorhead, who is a sort of infamous character in archaeology, it seems like there wasn't a place in North America that he didn't go to. And he would write like, oh, if only I had gotten to this super important site, I could have used my skill and expertise and had it not been excavated so poorly. And now we look at him and we think he was, you know, a butcher, you know. He did horrible things to archaeological sites. And so we try as archaeologists to not have that hubris because we know in 50, 100 years, you're going to be able to wave some sort of electronic wand over the ground and know exactly what's in it without ever disturbing it at all. And so the more that we can keep in the ground and preserve for that time, for that time and that place, the better off we're going to be. And yeah, people get that itch. They want to, they want to go look. But you know, as a state archaeologist, if a, if a graduate student or someone comes to me and says, I have this research design, we'll have to vet that very carefully. What is the, what is the, um, the value of going to survey it now versus using an existing collection, uh, you know, what, is, what can you bring to the table when it would otherwise be preserved for some future date? And I, it's not to say I wouldn't say yes or grab stakeholders and ask their opinions, but it's just to say we don't just say, yeah, go for it, you know? I mean, we're, we're sort of at the time where we have to be judicious about that. Now, it's a no-brainer if it's going to be destroyed, you go, you go excavate it. Um, or at least a sample of it, and you work with the stakeholders to come to a good resolution. Um, but in other cases, it's, it's a lot of the toss-up. You know, I go to conferences every year, and I'm, you know, my steam comes out of my ears about what people are doing uh, with new technologies and techniques, and a lot of it is non-destructive, you know, or minimally destructive, you know. So it's, it's amazing. Yeah? Can you speak a little bit about what you do or don't know about... Um, native presence here through archaeology? In Vermont? No, this Washington County. Oh, Washington County. Yeah, um, like I said, it's, it's um, no doubt Native Americans were here throughout time, uh, throughout prehistory, and through contact. In fact, there's some interesting um, ethno-historic accounts of, of um, 
like um, uh, a historian Jill Mudgett gave me a very interesting um, little piece about um, early 1800s, um, like basketry fair in Barrie and things like that. Um, so they were here through time. And relative densities of people here versus in the Champlain Valley or on the Connecticut River, that's, it's difficult to, to say, A, because we don't have a lot of data. And you know, I often say this when I teach classes, um, trying demography or the study of populations in the ancient past is, is the most thankless you know, task a, a, an archaeologist can do. Because you can run all the statistics in the world, and as soon as you publish your paper, you put your findings out, there's a million ways to chop it to bits. Um, it's just difficult to find out population densities or groups of people in the past, particularly you know, in areas like here. But were they here? Were, you know, were there people throughout time? Absolutely. All right, thanks, folks. <laughs>